Welcome to another Magenta Otter Travels road trip adventure. Join us for a day of exploring East Sussex and the Kentish countryside in which we will visit the stunning Bodium Castle first, followed by a quick stop at a charming village called Ewhurst Green, and then a wander around the famous and fascinating Great Dixter House and Gardens. And stay to the end of the video for a tour of the Oast House at Great Dixter. One of the things I've just learned is that Bodium Castle has one of the most important bat roosts in the UK. But it's 10 o'clock in the morning, so I'm not sure I'll be seeing any bats right now, but that would be kind of cool. On the way up to the castle, there's a World War II pillbox here. Sir Edward Dalingridge built Bodium Castle in 1385, and he also constructed a wharf area because the port at Bodium was well located and became busy with all kinds of trade. Sir Edward in particular wanted to take advantage of the trade in timber from local forests. What's funny is that the export of wool was banned, but sometimes fleeces were smuggled underneath the timber. This is actually really interesting to me because this morning as we were driving to Bodium Castle, driving through the Kent countryside, looking at all of the Kentish houses along the way, we were talking about the fact that the houses appear to be timber frame houses with either tiles or wood siding covering the exterior of the houses. And Ian was asking, I wonder why houses were built here out of wood rather than stone and brick like we see in so much of the rest of Britain. Our theory was that maybe it was because there were a lot of forests here and they did a lot of the harvesting of the local wood from these forests. It's a bit of a mixed bag. I'm always sad when my view of a castle is obscured with scaffolding, but I really love a moat. And I love that this castle has a moat around it. And I'm also glad that the castle is being restored and preserved for future generations. So I have to be supportive. To get to the castle from the car park, you have to walk on this relatively easy and flat gravel path. But along the way, you get a beautiful view of the exterior of the castle and the lovely moat. There's a little valley here that looks like it's full of beautiful magenta flowers. I don't know if they're, if it's valerian, thistles, foxgloves. I actually can't tell from here because my eyesight's not good enough. Families are having all kinds of fun riding wooden horses and having jousting and archery fun over here near this tent. I think this might be my favorite walk up to a medieval castle ever. I mean, isn't it just perfect? Guardsmen and soldiers would watch over the castle from the Barbican. And at the main castle entrance, you can still see the details of the portcullis and machicolations. I just learned a new word. Those are the holes where the soldiers would drop objects to stop attackers from getting in. There's some ducks standing guard at the castle now, but they look a little bit lazy and not very threatening. Not nearly as aggressive as the ones at Blenheim. You need to watch that video of me being attacked by a duck if you haven't already. There are some big fishies swimming around in there. I don't know what they are. Maybe trout? I don't know. I'm really bad at identifying fish. They're huge. I think they're carp. This is actually the original portcullis. It's made of oak and it is one of the oldest in the country. That's the machicolation. Machiculation. Yeah. that overhang the castle and rocks or objects would be thrown there. These holes here are the murder holes where boiling water or quick lime. Quick lime, boiling sand. Or boiling sand, yes. This is the Great Hall where Sir Edward would have dined and conducted matters of business. He also would have been entertained by visiting conjurers, acrobats, and jugglers. Also, minstrels would have entertained him here, singing stories such as the legend of King Arthur. 
On this side of the castle would have been the Lord and Lady's apartments so that they would have the morning sun coming in their windows. The lady of the castle did enjoy leisure and hobbies such as embroidery, but she was also the CFO of the castle and managed the castle accounts. And here in these windows, you can see the ledges below where they had window seats so you could sit and enjoy the sunshine. I'm going to go have a little explore in here. Oh, this is so cool. You can look up and see each floor that would have existed above with its doorway and fireplace going up a few stories above my head and then back down here at ground level you can see this arrow slit beyond it the moat outside this is a pretty low doorway though i had to duck pretty hard to get in here <laughs> it's interesting that looks like a fireplace and then a hole on the side to maybe provide heat for the adjoining room. This beautiful east facing window would have been full of stained glass. And this is where the chapel was on the first floor. And down here where I'm standing would have been the crypt. Christianity was a very important part of medieval life in England, and a priest would have lived here in the castle to be responsible for education and preside over all the Christian services in the chapel. The people here relied on the priest to forgive their sins and perform final rites for the dying so that they could be assured they would go to heaven. It's really fun when a castle ruin is not so ruined that you can't explore and see enough of the rooms to see what it would have been like, but still you're allowed to just wander around and use your imagination. Like, what was in this little niche here in the chapel? Was it a statue? Holy water? I don't know. Look what I've just found at the bottom of the stained glass window. The Holy Grail. Isn't that funny? Someone's put a chalice there. This area is the servants' quarters. The household apartments. This area is the kitchen. This is the giant fireplace that would have been the oven where they cooked all of their foods over the fire. And then this, I bet, was the bread oven. Here is another fireplace on this side of the other fireplace is where they would cook the meat. And go down these steps into the well and it's actually really cool that this well is still here with water and everything. This tower you're able to walk up to the top of. So Ian and I are now going to try to see a view. This is the best part of visiting the castle is coming up here to the top of the tower and having a view of the area all around. Lots of houses in the countryside. I see some oast houses over there. And here on the edge of the guard tower room is the medieval potty. In summary, Bodium really is the quintessential medieval castle, almost perfectly square with towers at each corner and a moat with a long causeway, a barbican, a crenellated gatehouse with machicolations, a portcullis, and murder holes. And there is two seconds of the steam train going by above the pillbox. And next we are going to Great Dixter. We're having a little unplanned stop. We're still driving to Great Dixter, but along the way, we just ran into this village. Ewhurst Green, and it is really pretty charming. One thing, we have a horse rider going through the village. This is the old post office, and it's just a fantastic old, very Kentish looking building. And then even more Kentish, four oast houses here. Isn't that fantastic? And this is the rectory cottage. This sloping roof thing is something I've not noticed anywhere else in Britain. 
the red clay shingles on the roofs and then the roof line sloping on the ends. It's just really different. This house is called Preachers and it is just full of Kentish charm. Okay, so that Ewhurst Green Village that I said looked so perfectly Kentish, I'm gonna have to eat my words on that because it's actually in East Sussex also. So let's just say that the architectural vernacular is typical of the Weald. And once again, we're here in Great Dixter, thinking it's Kent and it's actually East Sussex, but we're going to keep calm and carry on. This house was originally built in the 1450s, but was restored and expanded in 1910. And you can just see the way this porch is kind of leaning, but it's just a magnificent building. Great Dixter was the family home of the famous gardener and writer, Christopher Lloyd, who devoted most of his lifetime to creating this experimental, exciting, and constantly changing gardens. I was pleased to hear that the architect that helped Christopher Lloyd's father, Nathaniel, expand and restore the house was Sir Edwin Lutyens, who was also the architect of Lindisfarne Castle, a video I published. I will link it in the description if you'd like to check that out. Nathaniel Lloyd purchased the original medieval building in 1905. He and his architect commenced work on sympathetically restoring this building using original materials for the extensions. This involved buying a 16th century home from nearby Benenden, which was on the verge of demolition. That derelict timber frame home was dismantled and used to expand the original home on site and provide more living space. The great hall with its tall windows providing ample natural sunlight streaming into the room is just lovely. And my favorite part of Great Dixter House is this wee window, which is called a squint window. It's a way for people on the upper level of the house to peer in and see what's happening in the great hall below. When Lutyens was renovating the house, he added it back in for authenticity. And here's Ian looking down on us from above. Now that we've toured the house, let's have a walk through the famous gardens. Great Dixter is renowned throughout the world as being a place where people come to be trained as flower gardeners. The gardens here at Great Dixter are known for being pioneering, experimental, and extremely biodiverse. There are at least 2,000 species of plants here in the Great Dixter Estate Gardens. We have cornflowers and magenta cornflowers. I've not seen these before. I guess that's what happens when you have over 2,000 plants. You get things people haven't seen before. This here is the kitchen garden, but what I find most remarkable, here's the little, little gem lettuces starting to come in. But look at these guys. This is lettuce. It's like towering trees of lettuce. I've never seen anything like it. Christopher Lloyd worked on restoring the Great Barn and adjoining 19th century oast houses until his death in 2006. I've seen lots of oast houses, but have never been in one, so I'm excited to go check this one out. Here's the hops drying. Smells kind of hoppy in here. Oast houses date back to the 15th century. The word oast means kiln in Old English, and that's what they were. They were kilns to dry the hops that were harvested in September by the hoppers for the beer industry. These freestanding kilns had a furnace at the bottom, which sent heat up to the drying floor, which is where we are now. And on top of the conical or pyramidal roof, a white hooded roof vent cowl with a wind vane allowed for the hot air to escape. It takes seven to eight hours to dry each batch of hops. Once the hops were dried, they were dragged to cool them down and then pressed and packaged. Join us for the next video in this road trip series as we explore Kent, including Chillum, Sissinghurst, and some other delightful villages and towns along the way. Thanks so much for watching this video of Bodium and Beyond, and do something good in the world today.